Over the course of the last year, we've witnessed some notable events in which trusted news sources published poorly researched stories for monetary clicks and momentary outrage. From fake hate crimes to faux violence, whatever side you're on, Democrat, Republican, socialist, anarchist, we all know that the media only cares about sensationalism with the truth and people's reputations being left in the dust. In June of last year, the hammer of tabloid articles and clickbait chose me as a target. The legitimate cases of the Me Too movement set the stage for false allegations against me born from bitterness and jealousy. I was just another candidate in a long line of contestants. Chewed up and spit out, and guess what? The new cycle drags on. The mob ruled. Social justice drank its blood. I chose to go dark. Not because I was guilty, but because I value my privacy and the privacy of those around me. This is how I dealt with it. I had a lot to manage. The destruction of my marriage and family being the most important focus of my attention. But that's all finished now. My divorce is finalized and I'm ready to release the facts. In my married life, I made a lot of mistakes. I kept secrets resulting in the death of something that I thought was really beautiful. I'm not going to go into every detail of it because frankly it's still too fresh and painful. I quit touring uh, so that I could stay at home and raise my son and stop running around the world trying to make all these extramarital relationships work, which was the catalyst of this all and I will explain more about that in the future. But I'm not here today to talk about my failed marriage. It ended. That's that. I'm here to discuss the events of January 17th, 2017. To tell you the truth about my accuser and to give you the facts as it happened. I met Sarka Jemilkova in late 2014 while in Austria on tour with Combi Christ. She claims in her police report and the interviews she did during her press junket uh, instances that could have easily been verified if the proper research was conducted. She claims that I took her away from a, her, a group of her friends, that she was having a glass of wine with, with them in the bar, and I approached her, and I bought her a cocktail, and then all of a sudden she woke up in the backstage room covered in bruises, and she didn't know how she got there. Anyone who knows me know that couldn't be farther from the truth. <clears throat> the reality is she came up to me at the merch table while I was signing autographs after just being on stage. She brought two shots of alcohol with her. She offered me one. I declined as I was in my 16th year of sobriety. 16th, 16th year of sobriety at that time. But after some flirtatious conversation, I did offer to take her backstage. She accepted happily and we proceeded to have sexual intercourse thus beginning a relationship that we both enjoyed very much. In her report, she claimed that I asked for her phone number and she refused and just left the club. But in reality, she immediately hit me up on Facebook and started organizing another rendezvous. She traveled to another German city only a few days later and got us a hotel room. Instead of some grimy backstage room, we had room service and a bed. It was wonderful. I ended up filming that encounter with her which she was uh, fully aware of. Over the next two years, I tried to make things work. Seeing her every time I was in Europe, if I wasn't gonna be over there touring for a while, she would fly from the Czech Republic to the UK or to the States to see me. We would always get a hotel and enjoy each other's presence. January 2017 was no different. She came to Seattle. It was lovely. I even saw her again in the spring of that year when I was on tour in Europe, which was actually the last time I ever saw her. When I decided to quit touring in October of that year, our relationship was on the rocks. I had too many commitments and couldn't devote the time that she needed or wanted. It started to deteriorate over the course of a few months. On February 6, 2018, we ended it. She told me she had met someone else and she was going to get married. I was unaware of this 
And so I blocked her number and blocked her on all my social media. On February 8th, she called the police in the town I lived in and claimed that I drugged her, beat her unconscious, and raped her while she was unconscious. This is, this is, here's some text messages, messages from her. This is one before, before she came, on January 3rd, 2017. I'll do my very best to fulfill all your wishes. Yeah, as I think about it, I am actually so happy there isn't any single desire of yours I wouldn't try to become true. You can beat me and rape me as hard as you wish. On the 17th of January, we had that encounter. She went to the hotel. She was flying back to the Czech Republic. And while she was at the airport, she texted me, I love you so much. It feels like my, it feels like leaving a part of my heart over here. Could you do me one, could you do one little thing for me to make me a bit happier, sir? Please send me that photo of your hand on my lower back. It looked so beautiful. I sent her the photo. You were so wonderful, she replies. And you saw, I hold with myself not to cry this time because I know that it won't take too long to be with you, but leaving still hurts. Three days later on January 22nd, she writes, the first moment when I'll be able to tell you that there's no need for any worries about the future anymore. I write, please, I'm waiting. Ugh, I need that. And she goes, sir, I'll make you able to have everything you need soon and then you will choke me and rape me. Two days later on January 24th, yes, because it shows what you mean to me, how special you are and how much power you have over me. Please, daddy, beat me and rape me and let it feel like you are so deep in me that my heart is being stabbed by your cock. She sends a picture. January 26th, a week, a week after I see her. Almost 10 days. Yes, please, I desperately need you and your violence is a prelude of all things to come. Can you imagine how excited you made me? I should be preparing to go to work as I need to leave at about 30 minutes, but I'm still, but I'm sitting here with my cunt dripping wet and I'm unable to get it all out of my head. Please rape me and be who you really are with me so we can have, so we can everything. So with me so you can everything she's from the Czech Republic she her English is kind of broken I love that feeling that I am letting you free yourself and all your depravity that's just from a week that's just from a week I sent her that 17 second clip that everybody saw that makes me look like a monster and and we were dirty talking and I sent it to her and she, she says, out right after I sent it to her, I'm trying to make you feel it every day. I will do my best to soothe I will do my best to soothe every discomfort, sir. I'm yours to do with me whatever pleases you. Yes, you are my God, my everything I'm living for, and I'm here to surround your depravity with my love and satiate all your lust. This is what she says at the beginning of our encounter. On January 2017. Tell me how big it is. See? <laughs> it's the biggest cock I have ever seen in the sun. And then this is what she says at the end of the encounter, when she is not tied up, not beaten, not unconscious, and not drugged. So I ask, if this woman was brutally raped, drugged, and beaten against her will multiple times, why would she continue to have any sort of communication like this at all? Let alone this sort of normal communication we had 
throughout our entire relationship. These messages were all sent within the same month, so you can imagine there are hundreds if not thousands more. Some of you will say that I'm just so powerful she couldn't consent, but aren't these text messages a clear indication of her enthusiastic consent? Some people might say that she was too afraid of me to consent, that she, but she's the one that traveled from the Czech Republic all the way to the west coast of America to see me multiple times. It didn't seem as though she was afraid of me at all. Her enthusiasm was highly intoxicating. Sarka claims in interviews uh, that she was an experienced BDSM player and was familiar with red as a safe word. She never called red in any of our encounters, which is a standard practice in any BDSM relationship and could have at any time, or just said no or stop. Every encounter I had with her ended with her lying in my arms telling me that she loved me. Never once did she say I crossed the boundary. I'll, and I'll be completely honest, in the past I haven't used safe words. I took cues from their body language, and of course if anyone ever said red or stop, then I would, but that never happened. Personally, I found safe words like waffles and blueberries to be dumb. And they took me out of the role-playing experience, so I, I never really incorporated those into my BDSM play. Perhaps that was a, a mistake. I trusted that anyone who was taking part in these situations with me would be upfront and tell me if they were unhappy with anything that went on. I'm not a mind reader. Regret doesn't mean that you were raped. A broken heart doesn't mean that you were violated. Just because I broke up with her doesn't mean I abused her. <clears throat> a couple of days ago, I sent her a message giving my consent to release this footage I had with her from that January encounter. The video is filmed with her consent. She's looking right at the camera when she says those words. And it's the entire video. And not just the 14 second clip that she shared publicly herself since she claims that I drugged her, beat her unconscious, and raped her, the court of public opinion decided to side with her and the story she told. Why don't we all just look at the evidence? The same evidence the King County Prosecutor's Office looked at and decided not to file charges against me. You heard the audio. I'll play the video for anyone who wants to see it. You all should ask Sarka to release it. Here's a timeline of events, right? In January 2017, we had sex in a hotel in Seattle that she paid for. She filed this rape claim 13 months later on February 8th, 2018, two days after I broke up with her. Then three months of review of the, from the prosecutor's office, they declined to file charges in late May. That's when they went to the press and decided to try me in the court public opinion. Now I'm not here to bully or intimidate her. I'm here to share my side of the story. All the articles that were written about me had one side of events. And some of you know that. Some of you have been waking up to that. The story they printed, that's the story they printed. The journalists that I've spoken to who have seen this evidence have all decided not to pursue the story. Now, why would the prosecutor's office decline to file charges for a very serious crime like rape and abuse and torture? Why would they decline to file charges? Why would the media who has seen this stuff decline to write the story? Because it doesn't fit with the narrative that I'm a monster. It won't get clicked. It won't get clicks. It just proves that Sarka was lying. And now you all should know the truth. I'll say it again. I will consent to the world seeing this footage, this video of her so-called rape. If Sarka will do the same, you can all see the reality. Shit, I'll post it on my website or Twitter. I feel as though a lot of you have this distorted idea of who I am as a person. As if I keep some harem of women chained up in a basement as sex slaves and I drink blood or some stupid goth bullshit. The truth is, 
that I was in extramarital relationships with multiple consenting adults who were all aware I was married and had a kid. At the end of the day, I wasn't able to fulfill the, that, those commitments that I had made toward, toward each and every one of them. It bred bitterness and most disappointingly of all, jealousy. I'm powerless to defend myself in the current climate that we live in. If I defend myself, I'm bullying the victims. If I stay silent, I'm running away because I'm guilty. It's a lose-lose situation. There's no way I could have defended myself without my words being twisted. I've stayed silent because I wanted to be considerate of other people's feelings. But I can see these people just won't let it go. They continue to harass people in my life, people that I love, including my ex-wife who recently received an email telling her that she should go kill herself. It's ridiculous. At this point, I've got nothing left to lose. You've taken it all. My friends consider me a pariah. My label and band are gone. The music industry has moved on and the relationships that I've carefully built over the last 15 years are destroyed. My marriage obliterated and I barely get to see my son who is the most important person in my life. At the end of the day, I don't give a shit about my fucking career or my so-called friends, material things, or what people say about me or think about me on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. I don't give a shit, but I do care about my son. I care about providing a life for him that I didn't have as a child. So to the phony industry people, the musicians and bands I've worked with that have turned their backs on me, thank you. Thank you to the dummies on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook that were so quick to send death threats without the real facts. Thank you for showing me who you are. Thank you for making this experiment in human misery work so beautifully. You're all so easily manipulated. With a few simple tall tales, a couple of people gossiping, a blog filled with lies, the court of public opinion has reached a verdict. A beautifully misdirected verdict that proves how dumb some of you really are. Suffering is one very long moment. We cannot divide it by seasons. We can only record its moods and chronicle their return. Oscar Wilde pens this after losing everything and how right he was.